recording this morning, so I'm like really hyper and wired. So let's go, Gail. <laughs> okay, we are now on the air. All right, we are official. Hey, Winnie Anderson here. I'm the host of Let's Talk Tech, the show that debuted on January 4th. It is a podcast available at techshowpodcast.com, and the show is designed to demystify the software, services, systems, and apps that we entrepreneurs need to run and grow a profitable business today. And this this episode, uh, this special episode of Let's Talk Tech, this Blab episode, was something I came up with like last week, and it is a sort of patterned after Oprah's after show kind of concept, and it's designed to really go a little bit deeper into a topic that just aired recently. So ideally, eventually, I'm hoping that the Tuesday show will air, right? On Tuesdays, it airs in iTunes. And then on Wednesday, we'll have the after show. So that's the focus. I, I know that it won't always be completely perfectly synced with the same same guest, but, you know, that's the joy of doing stuff live on the web, right? So yesterday's episode was part of a three episode mini series on self publishing and book marketing that I was so thrilled to do with the fabulous, the lovely and talented Bruce Jones, who is next to me. Bruce is a book and and product creation expert. And and I'm telling you, you know, there are a lot of people that you hear, oh, they're an expert and and they're not. Bruce, however, really is. So what makes Bruce so special is, and there are many things that make him special besides the fact that he's just a heck of a nice guy and, and incredibly smart. Bruce created a product that, get this, has generated a million dollars in and it's about maps. So come on. <laughs> if he can make that work, I'm sure he's got some ideas that will help your product work too, or your book idea. So Bruce, we did, like I said, we did three episodes together, two audio and a video. You can see the video episode at techshowvideos.com. And that particular episode focused on formatting a book for Kindle. The other two episodes, the two audio episodes that you can get at techshowpodcast.com are on just general self-publishing, and then we did a focused one on book marketing. And of course, since the show is Let's Talk Tech, we talked about the technology because that's what hangs us up, right? We've got a brilliant idea, and then we got to make it happen. How do we do that? So, you guys might feel like you're coming into the middle of a movie, so I, I want you to make sure that you go and you get those other episodes so you can, you know, get all of Bruce's fantastic knowledge and information. I'm just like the, you know, the facilitator of all experience. It's him who's got the smarts. So in this episode, what we're going to be doing is going a little bit deeper into some of the elements that we talked about over those three episodes and, and even some things that we didn't get a chance to talk about. So welcome, everybody. Bruce, are you ready to talk tech? I am ready. I am ready. Awesome. Awesome. So the lovely Gail, who I'm a big smooch to, the fabulous Gail Brown, she is going to be helping. And I'm sure Judy will pitch in as she can. She'll be helping facilitate the the chat here. So I'm going to be looking back and forth and doing my best. But feel free to ask your questions. And hopefully... You've got this rocking here, Gail. So, Bruce, welcome, and I have big news for you. So, I checked the, the show stats, of course. In launch period, you're a compulsive, you know, stat checker, you know. <laughs> so, I checked the stats this morning. The show has been at number four on New and Noteworthy for a week, which is exciting. Bruce's episode, his latest episode with me, has now is now the highest downloaded episode of all time, seven weeks. So, so we have about, I think Bruce, you have about 210 downloads oh, on cool. your episode. Good, 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 good. So good. that's exciting. I'm thrilled for you. So let's get right into the content here. Hey, Joe yeah. Cortana. Um, first of all, let's talk about, you know, the mechanics of this whole process, because of course we all have great ideas and then we, you know, 
the devil is in the details. So one of the things that that we want to talk about is if, if the mechanics of getting the book done, right? So let's let's jump into some of the questions that we were asked ahead of time and one is about actually getting this book done and now or maybe you're sort of done right and Kindle has the option of doing something that's called pre-order right and I'm glad Joe Cortana is on here because he had a scary experience with a pre-order thing I hope you don't mind my sharing that Joe when uh, when you were first doing your first book Joe so uh, Bruce you want to talk about that pre-order thing you give your two cents and, and I'll give mine so I have some views about pre-order, and I've been involved in some launches that had pre-orders in them. So the pre-order program, the Kindle pre-order program is a program where you can um, put up a notice that your book is, is available for ordering and will be available on a certain date. And then um, you have to submit, I think, an outline for that, which are also held to some pretty strict rules by Amazon to get your book done by that time. So you have to have it done. And... Um, and then you have to submit your book and it goes through the whole process and, and it gets ordered. And people can buy the book before it's available. My own experience with it and what I've seen is that I'm not a big fan of the pre-order process for a couple of reasons. One, especially if you're a new author and you haven't been through the process of creating a book, is it puts a huge amount of stress on you. A lot of things go wrong making a book. The editing takes longer than you want. <clears throat> you can't finish the writing. Whatever it is that you're doing, something goes wrong. And so... The, having this pre-order, and, and if you don't get the book up when, you, you know, when you're when you supposed to, Amazon penalizes you and can sort of throw you, off, throw you off your account. So it puts a huge amount of stress on getting the book up and going. Um, so right there, there's things happening. And I've just been involved with a number of launches where people have sort of just been completely stressed out because they can't get the thing edited. The second thing that happened is, unfortunately, most books don't really sell all that many and you're wasting i think it's just my own view of it is you're wasting a lot of the book energy selling and promoting a book that isn't done and there's nothing to read so you're bringing people in to, to sort of buy this book get them excited that you have a new book out everybody thinks it's sort of they don't understand the pre-order process they order the book but nothing really happens and then eventually a month later or whenever it is that you've set the launch date the book eventually shows up in your Kindle account. But by then, people have moved on to, to something else. They've gone somewhere else. And they may notice your book or may not notice your book. But I like having a book that launches and have the whole book really there. So you can put all your effort into launching your book. You can put it out. And people can actually get it and can read it and comment on it and do reviews and do all the things that they're supposed to do. That For me, that's the way that a book should be launched. And if for some reason something goes wrong doing it the regular way, well, no one really knows. You just kind of move your own date out and adjust your marketing. But you're not being held under some rules by my Amazon that's going to penalize you or just cause you a lot of grief and stress. So yeah. I'm just not a big fan of it. I don't think it's worth it. I think if you've got to put all your effort into launching your book, launch your book, get your fans excited, and get them to actually read your book and see your book and, and get reactions to it. So I try to avoid it or I try to discourage people from, from doing it. So Yeah, I'm with you. And I hate it for all those reasons, as well as a couple of other ones. One of the big reasons, because I'll tell you what, I did it. I, I wrote a book in 21 days. Yes, it got to be a number one bestseller. They were the worst 21 days of my life. I want you to know that. They really were. They were horrible. And my husband, who is wonderful, would probably never say they were 21 of the worst days that he was married to me, because I'm sure there have been plenty more than 21 worst days. But... That, because I was up until 2 a.m. every night. One night I stayed up 24 straight hours, you know, and then into the next day just to finish it because I had realized that I had mistakes. I mean, who wants to live like that? But the other reason that is more important and, and the bigger reason I hate it is because the average person is not usually too sophisticated with the use of all of their little gadgets, right? I, I confess to Bruce, I can't use my smartphone. <laughs> I know it's embarrassing. I run a show called Let's Talk Tech. I, I don't know why, because I'm the tech illiterate. So I, I know enough to be dangerous. I shouldn't say I'm illiterate. But anyway, so, so you've put this book out. You've sold it. And people get it. 
right? It's only an outline or whatever is the minimum requirement from, uh, I almost said Netflix, the minimum requirement of Amazon. Right. But if they don't have the settings on their gadget done, they won't get the updates. Oh, they won't even get it, huh? So they have to have their gadget up, you know, alerted for updates or they're not getting it. So to me, you've sold something. Now, what about the brand that you're building? So this person does not know this. You might not have, not have even noticed, known that. And they're hating you. They're feeling like they got cheated some way and they thought they were doing you a favor by buying your book. So here's this brand you're building and all of a sudden you have done, because who are they going to blame? Not you, not them. They're not going to say, oh, I, I should have known. They're going to blame you. Right, and, right. and I'm really concerned about that. And that and managing my own life, I'll never go through that again. So um, we're not saying don't do it. Make a good decision. Understand what you're getting involved in. And I think that so many of us say, hey, that's a great idea. I'll do it. And then go, how do you do this? Right. And, then and I you, think then that, you I mean, if you really that. wanted to do it, I would have the book completely done and just pretend that it isn't done and have everything done so that your book you just sort of doing this as a marketing ploy if you really thought you were going to do it. But, I mean, or, I've been having a lot of books at the, you know, that I get calls. I had one call in the middle of the, I was at guitar camp. I was standing in the guitar camp in a performance and I got a call and I ended up and standing in a field in New Hampshire from somebody who was launching their book the next day and they were trying to fix the formatting and couldn't get it. So there's a lot of sort of technical things that just little tiny things that, you know, that you need to do that, just kind of mess you up. And, and you know, I like yeah. the user, for me, the user experience is all about it. Is, is It's wonderful to have a book and have, have your fans and your, ready, your people are all ready to kind of read your book and they're excited about it. They want to read it when, you know, they don't want to read it next month. They want to read it today no, when they're right. trying to support you. So that's what you want yeah. to do. And so, yeah, and that's a great point. That. So I think that I love the idea of the pre-sale and I think that I, I like the idea of using it like a graduated price increase. So it's pre-sale at 99 cents or that kind of thing. And I love that this is the first version. So let go ahead and pre-sell it and it's not perfect. And then, and then, but then tell everybody, you know, even put a right. page in here. This is the early release version. Please send me comments. Please send me typos, whatever you find, and then send out that next version. But yeah, have the book really done done and it's done, the done, polishing done. yeah right. yeah done, done, Love done. That. It's just too many things go wrong so so yeah yeah so I, we'll, I, we'll give a, a thumbs down on on the pre-order thing that's right <laughs> that's a, hey that, there you go we should do a thumbs hey, up and a thumbs down in honor question. of in honor of the beloved roger ebert who is one of my all-time favorite right, critics right. and people and down, so, so it, an, another question <coughs> that bruce got after doing our episodes what has to do with the editing process and how do you get editors so uh, bruce why don't you come out with your suggestions and i'll share my two cents because right. i've actually worked with a couple of editors so editing, finding an editor is really, really important to the quality of your book. I usually put it as part of the, the marketing tips is to get your book edited because people really notice the a book that isn't edited very well and they'll make comments about it in your reviews. So you can find editors. Often you may have a family friend who's an editor, who's a reporter that can make a good editor. And there are different kinds of editors. There's sort of copy editors, there's proofreading editors, and there's sort of development editors. Most of us will probably never use a development editor but we very much can use a copy editor or a proofreading editor. Proofreading editor comes at the sort of the end. You're just almost ready to go out the door, make sure everything is right. Copy editor sort of looks at your manuscript. So very often we have somebody local that may be a, a reporter is a good person or a professor somewhere, an English professor, somebody like that can make a good editor. Um, somebody that has already edited books. I like having someone who has already pre-done, has edited other books, like just somebody who's brand new to the editing process. It is it's sometimes difficult. I, I also like someone who understands editing marks. So they give me back my copy. They've marked up with just very simple like paragraph returns and, in, and put things in, just understands that language a little bit. Um, if you're going online, you can, there's a service called uh, fiverr.com is a place that a lot of people use. It's a freelance site that you can go. The, the thing about Fiverr is you don't know quite who you're gonna get. So you wanna test maybe 
three or four different editors with a little piece of copy that you send out, see what you get, see what the working relationship is. It's not very expensive to do that. Um, could be $5. Um, if you're using like a create space, maybe doing a print book, create space and the other print on demand sites like Lulu and Blur, but specifically create space. If you look in the back, they have all kinds of packages that you can get. They give you one, a nice, a fairly decent pricing idea, what editing costs and what you get how many rounds you get, that kind of thing. So if you go to createspace.com, which is the print on demand side of Amazon for print books like this, print book like this, um, you just sort of dig in the back and you'll see there's some nice different packages that you can get. And that's a, a great way to get editors too. So local, local professors, reporters, professionals like that, local freelance editors that you can just sort of Google the fiber method, create space method, um, and then referral networks through your friends, especially if you're in different publishing groups on Facebook is a great way to do it too. Um, yeah, those are great ideas. And especially the, I'm a big proponent of the college or the local college, the local university area. If you have a college or university in your, you know, easily accessible to you, use them because you've got these professors you've got who often have published books, right? They've gotten, whether right. they have been <laughs> national bestsellers or not, right? right. They, so they're very used to the entire process. And then you also have the non-traditional student, the adult who has come back to school, maybe to, to get an additional degree or some kind of additional study in writing, and they too have often gotten a lot of things published. So big proponent of using the local folks if you can. And let's face it, let's let's really make a contribution to our own local economy as much as we can right, and support right. our local folks. So a big big Yahoo for going for the college people. A couple of things I want to mention about the, the those types of editors, and I'm glad you shared that that there are these different types of editors. I've actually worked with all three and I've done my own editing. I actually, I actually edited a textbook. Um, so, but please, I don't do that professionally. Please do not reach out to me. <laughs> I know there aren't enough editors out there, but I'm not one of them. I, I, I no, thank you. Uh, it's too time consuming really, to be honest with you. I just, I don't have the time right now. Um, but I've worked with all three types and the development editor, where you would work with that kind of person, I think, is when you're really ready to make a big push with your book. So you don't have to have the book not written yet. You don't have to have the book in stages. You could have launched a Kindle book and now you're ready to get that that print version done and you really have momentum behind you. Maybe you have been really working hard at building your platform. So you're ready to come out with all your guns blazing. You do not want schlock. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think a couple other points I would do too. It's nice to be able to sit with someone if you can to sort of discuss things. It's so much easier than email. So if that's possible, also look for an editor that if you're, subject is a little esoteric or different or maybe technical or medical or something, find somebody that knows the lingo and the words and the tech and the thing. So a college would be a great place. You have a wide variety. If you're doing something on, you know, global warming, you might look in the, you know, the social sciences, I mean, the sciences area, the biology area to find someone who's familiar with those terms. And then another thing that has helped me a lot, because I didn't learn to write for a long time, is your editor, you don't have to be perfect with your writing. That's what an editor does. So, you know, we, there's a real perfection freezes progress sort of thing that happens when we're writing and we just freeze up. We, we want it to be perfect before we release it even to an editor. Release it, let it go because the editor can fix it. So your job is to get the ideas down, the order down, the basic copy right. down. But if you're not, if your writing skills aren't, you know, really up high, like mine are, are you know, sort of here, um, an editor is a huge, a huge savior for you and can put things right. in order and fix things and, and get everything the way it should look. So right. you don't have to be perfect. That's why you hire an editor. Yeah. They're the ones. Editors are your friend. So, yeah. You know, yeah. too often, tool. yeah, too often, um, too often we see these people, editors and people like that as our, the school teacher. Like we, I'm not kidding. We have a major flashback. I used to teach business writing actually. And it was so funny to see these vice presidents and directors in, in my 
my corporate classroom and they would be like, I had a ruler and a red pen. I'm like, you're not going to get fired. Okay. And I'm not going to crack your knuckles. So, <laughs> so no, Bruce is dead on. Know that the editor is your friend here and that many of them specialize also in genres. So you, and you really want somebody who specializes because then they're so focused on, as Bruce said, the lingo, they know what sells, and they're also usually so skilled that they keep their writing style out of your writing style. And that that's an, you know, you got to be really good. That's not me. I stink. Right. That's why I only did the grammar and the proof editing because I want to rewrite it to be me. So you don't want me to edit your, edit your book. That's aw awesome tips. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, no, I can say also too that when I work with my editor, my editor gives me. She wants. She's an old. She's a newspaper, former newspaper columnist and reporter, and and so she gives me. I give her paper copy, and she marks it up um, with pencil, and then I go in and make all the corrections. So you know, depending, it, that can be very time consuming. So you know, to go in and do all the corrections. So check with the editor that you're working with. Are they rewriting your copy and making it? Are they doing all that work, or are you doing it? And, you know, how, what is the workflow going to be? So there's many different ways you can do it. Um, that's the way that I work where, where she gives me back basically the manuscript that I, I hand her and it's marked up and, uh, and I go in and do all the corrections on it. So it saves a lot of money because she's not sitting there putting all that stuff in. So, yeah, that's but good. I'm sure point. other editors that's are different. I'm sure others, other, other editors are different. So, yeah. And I'm the kind of person I'm so physical and tactile. I know that when on my, the textbook job that I had, I, I got the physical manuscript and which I actually liked. Um, but there are definitely those people who use, you know, the electronic track your changes and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So, yeah, you want to have a whole conversation about this and, and find out how do they best work? How do you like to work? How do you want to work? So you want to have some thinking going on about, you know, your own style as well. So uh, Helena says that she's done a lot of medical editing. That's really awesome. So, so, well, you know what? And as far, as far as the price goes, I think that one thing is, and in my philosophy is none of us know how to buy anything. <laughs> so uh, we don't, right? We buy food and then it rots in our vet in our refrigerator. Right? We, right? We, don't to, we buy cars and then go, what did I buy this for? So we buy clothes that don't fit or that we never wear. We don't know how to buy anything. So part of our job as independent professionals is to help the buyer, help the right buyer make the choice to work with us and understand what goes into the pricing. And too often, a person will go right to price because it's the one tangible thing that makes sense to them. Right. And then what will happen is they'll look at what you charge and they'll automatically compare it to things that they that are tangible for them, their own paycheck, their, you know, what they paid on groceries last week. You know, so they'll, they're equating it to something that has nothing to do with anything. Right. Right. So your job is to help them see the value in your work and this is true for any of us for for helena for for all of us to help them see the value and help them rationalize and make sense of paying that price that it's going to get them it's going to save them time it's going to say lower their stress it's going to get them to the money faster it's going to help them achieve their goals faster so that's just a little lecture about sales there that, that kind of went off track, but I hope that helps because it really is, it really is crazy. Um, so another piece that people, we, we touched on in our other episodes, and again, they're at techshowpodcast.com or techshowvideos.com. Um, you, we talked about images. Bruce and I know you know I I made Bruce do a lot of prep for the show because that's that's how crazy <laughs> I, I wrote am. a book. I wrote he a did. whole book. Yes. <laughs> if you're going to be by Winnie, expect to work, but you also get fantastic. You write a book basically preparing to do Winnie's shows. So, um, so I have a two birds. Huh? So you kill two birds with one stone. You, you get, get a product, product and you, you get, get all this great content. You're on whatever you're being interviewed on. You get another book out of it because she asks you all these questions. And if you take the time, which I did, to sit there and type them all up over four days, <laughs> um, I have another, which I have right in front of me here. So it's yeah, no, it's well, great. One of the great resources that Bruce had provided to me in his in his notes was this long list of of image sites. So Bruce, you want to talk about images and how different they are in the Kindle book, yeah. especially, and then where do you get these images from? 
So images can come. So images are a great way to add to your book. And um, in and I've just been sitting here struggling because I'm releasing the Kindle version of my new book. So I'll do a shameless plug, Book Marketing for Self-Publishing. And so I'm bye. doing the um, the Kindle version right today. I was working on it and I'm putting images. So I have in my book, you know, images. And um, let me just show you like an image. So like there's an image of me, you know, making a book trailer video and stuff. And um, so images can come. So images are great to add to the book. So if you're doing print books, it often comes down to the, the dots per inch, the DPI. So if you're doing print books through Create Space, Print on Demand, you want 300 dot per inch images. If you're doing Kindle books, it's just a world of confusion. And I have never, I still Sad struggle true. mightily with it. Generally, the pictures can be 72 dots per inch, 96 dots per inch. And they have now changed their specs to want 300 dots per inch. And, and part of the problem that images are so tricky on the Kindle side is there's so many different platforms. Your Kindle book can be on this. It can be on an iPad. There isn't anything standard in the Kindle world. Um, so it, it creates a lot of confusion. So you do kind of struggle through it. And I kind of make images about this size at about 72 dots per inch. But I still haven't figured all of it out. So okay. images can come from a, a bunch of different places. You can make an image yourself. Like for my new book, I made some of my own images. I just either use the book cover or graphics. You can buy them from stock houses. And a lot of the stock houses have really opened up their licensing. So popular stock houses would be Shutterstock is a big one. A lot of people have heard of iStock and Getty and um, uh, Dreamstime or other ones. But certainly Shutterstock is a great place to buy images because they've changed their licensing arrangements so that we can put them into eBooks now. It used to be they kind of restricted it. <clears throat> now they let you do it, which is fantastic. So you can get some really good pictures if you want to pay for them. Um, and sites like Shutterstock have very um, have some very good pricing on, on images. So that's a route. You can go to the, 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 um, the stock house route and buy images. And those will be generally, they're royalty free. So you don't have to pay any more money for them. And the copyright and all of licensing has been taken care of. So that's something you want to pay attention to when you go and put images in your book. Right. Now, Bruce, you don't want to, I'm sorry. Say, you, don't, you don't want to grab, just grab random images off of the web and right. stick them in your book. You need to make sure that you have the rights to use those yeah, images. Yeah, there's no thievery. No, no. Yeah, just because it's online does not mean it's free, does not right. mean that it's open access. Please, please, please. You, you know, I tell people all the time, be the client that you want to have. So right. you know that you value your work and that you deserve the rates that you charge. Well, those people who are in the graphic arts and in, in any kind of visual work, they deserve to be compensated too. So be a good person, no bad karma. Bruce, just a couple of things here about, about images. Images are not just the pictures, right? They're right. actually right. like charts and graphs. So for those That's of you right. who are thinking, hey, right. I don't have pictures, but I got, ch I got charts and graphs though. So they apply as images too. That's right. And the thing to remember about like in, in my new book, like here I have a graph, sort of a chart, you know, in my book, the thing to remember about Kindle books is it's a fluid medium. And so sometimes you're on a device that's big. Sometimes you're on a device that's small. The text changes shape and size as it goes from medium to medium. So your pictures have to adjust. So if you're doing a book that maybe has charts and, and, and graphs in it that you did in Microsoft Word, those don't adjust very well because they can't sort of adjust and be text can adjust and go like that but the graphics can't really adjust. So usually what I recommend on anybody who has charts and graphs and tables is to either screen capture those charts and graphs and turn them into a JPEG graphic and put them in that way. That's usually the best way to do it. Then they have flexibility, they can, they can move. Another thing to think about with graphics is that, again, because it's fluid, if you have a caption on your photograph, is to incorporate the caption into the graphic. So you would open up your graphic, maybe in Photoshop or a photo editing tool or something online, and type the graphic right into the bottom of the picture. Just add a little white, put the type in there. And now when that picture sort of moves through the book, changing to different platforms, the caption will go with the picture. So it's not uncommon that the caption will go to the next page from the picture and you have this sort of little line at the top and the picture's over here. Yeah, so, that's a brilliant uh, tip. 
Yeah, you yeah. just kind of keep them together. And it's a very easy thing to do using, you know, online tools or Photoshop or, you know, whatever you have. Right. Um, Another place to get pictures, you can take pictures yourself. You can take a camera. Let's say you're doing a book on, you know, let's just say um, the beach or something like that, or seaweed or global warm. You can go out and take pictures. You just want to be careful in the picture that you don't have things that have rights on them, like people. People. Like you can have backs of people, but you don't want to have faces of people. Right. Buildings. It's, we don't always realize it, but buildings, specifically sort of not your average house, but just buildings, all are copywritten by the architect. The architect owns the rights to the design of the building and owns the copyright to a building. So buildings are copywritten, individual buildings. You can do skylines is fine, but you know, individual buildings are copyrighted, except maybe on government buildings, depending on how they were done. So, you know, those you can do. But you just want to be careful of your if you're zoning in on a particular building or a custom building or a custom house or something, there's a copyright on that. Yeah. Um, if there Get are permission. logos Get permission. Yeah. Just get permission for it. And certainly every building, I've done a lot of work as a designer with buildings. You know, we use buildings all the time and things. You go to the building management and get, they have permission and you can build, you know, they'll have pictures, they have things ready to go. You can use it. Um, I was going to say the, um, yeah, so take a picture. Oh, if you have logos and things, be careful of branded logos. If you have a Nike logo or, a, you know, um, I don't know, Boston Market logo, somebody owns that logo. The corporation owns that. So you try not to have those kind of things in your pictures. So you can get them yourself. You can make graphics yourself. You can get from stock. And, and I just saw a comment here. I'm not using stock, but I'm a big fan of stock. I've used a lot of stock in my in my work um, because the, the licenses have changed. And it's a very it's a great way to get sort of uh, really nice pictures. Um, you can go into the public domain. You always know, have to be careful to check rights. But if you use the date of 1923, pretty much anything before 1923. And I usually will use the 1921 is basically in the public domain, which means that you have the the copyright has expired on that picture, so you can go and get that image. So where do you get those? There's a lot of places, but a big one is the Library of Congress. So if you want maps, or you're doing pictures of the West, or all kinds of things, you want to check. Some collections do have restrictions on them, but the Library of Congress and other U.S. government, um, anything from the U.S. government is basically in the public domain if it's if the pictures are taken by u.s government employees so national park pictures um nasa pictures military pictures all of these are in the public domain and you have access to them you always want to read the rights and every website has rights but every department in the u.s government has an office of pictures and things the department right. of agriculture and, is a great one so and we're we're not attorneys we don't play them <laughs> on the internet we do, we are not giving you legal advice. So right. the big thing here is always, always, always check, verify, make sure you've got permission. Do not just go, oh, well, I think that was done before <laughs> 1923. And no, always, always verify. Again, be the person you want to, to have as a client. And, and you would want to have as a client somebody who is very careful, somebody who checks to make sure and validate. So let's just, I want to chime in on this little thread that was about using stock images as well. I've used stock images. I work very closely with my uh, brand developer who I interviewed this morning for an upcoming episode of Let's Talk Tech. And so I am, you know, I'm fortunate. I have a designer who I work very closely with and I can get a lot of original work from when you're used, but sometimes you gotta, you know, you gotta use stock stuff, whether it's for budget or just for whatever it is that you're talking about. You do want to be sensitive to choosing images that are not the run of the mill thing that you see everywhere. Right. And I'm, I'm an old time corporate person and we used to get junk mail, right. We would get direct response uh, materials for courses, seminars, workshops, whatever. I worked in human resources. And we used to laugh because there was this one guy who actually looked like somebody I worked with. And he was very handsome. <laughs> and, but, and he always had, you know, had a suit and a briefcase. He was in everything, right? Don't do that. It's so obvious that it's you, right. that it's not right. you, right? So, so you want to make sure that you're choosing the appropriate image, but also that it doesn't have like 11 gajillion downloads and that you haven't already seen it everywhere, right? So you want to just be really careful about what you're choosing. But by by all means, if you can get some original stuff, 
do it. And that picture of Bruce, I just want to, to say, people really want to see you. And, you know, I've been getting, why why aren't we seeing you on your, your site? And I can promise you I'm going to start uh, adding more pictures of myself. <laughs> as horrible as it is for me, I want you to know. Um, so people do want to see you. They As they right. get to know right. you and you draw them into your world, they develop this emotional connection with you. And I can tell you, running a podcast is a very intimate experience because I'm now in your ear. And, <laughs> and people, uh, I'm amazed at the connection. I mean, I'm not kidding. I was talking talking earlier when we started that people are asking me about Judy, when my, my fabulous production assistant. And when I get a tech problem, because they know Judy helps me, they'll be like, well, why didn't Judy fix that for you? Where's Judy? So it's really <laughs> funny how people make that emotional connection with you. But so have your own pictures in there. Anything else on the image thing, Bruce? Um, if you are looking online, uh, what has sort of there's, there are different there's sort of general copyright and royalty free and public domain, but also the Creative Commons licensing is a new licensing sort of um, scheme that has sort of developed over a number of years uh, around the internet and things on the internet. And there is a different variety of different sort of licensing options for things, pictures, text, and things. And a lot of people release images to the world under the Creative Commons license. And there are different sort of levels of them. I mean, you have to, they're kind of a little bit confusing. But if you search in Google under CC0, which is Creative Commons Zero, the zero are for public domain images. And that will bring up a lot of sites that have public domain images. And it's a great way to kind of quickly get to them. Again, you want to make sure you're actually getting something that's in the public domain. You want to make sure that's, a, you know, it's an image that you can get. You can also take that image and put it into Google Images and search and see if it shows up on a site somewhere they have. Not only can you search words in Google, you can search pictures in Google. So you can take that picture that you find. You think, okay, I love this picture. This is what I want to use. Let me just make sure that somebody didn't steal it and sort of stick it out into the public domain. You can put it into Google Images uh, and copy it in, and it will Google will search and see if you can find that image. But you do your due diligence. But it's a it's a great way to sort of find images. Um, I've also done it on, on Wikipedia. If you go into an image on Wikipedia and click on the image and click on it, you will get to the rights page for that particular image, and you will find that a lot of people release these images to the world. And they'll tell you, here are the rights. They're very picky about their rights. They'll say, this is an image that you can use, or this is an image you have to give credit for. There's different sort of levels, so just read that, but it's also a great way. So I think, you know, between stock, your own, what you create, you know, a lot of stock, um, stock sites also have free public domain things that you can probably trust a lot. There are also public domain stock sites. There's a wide range of places to, to kind of get it. And, Fantastic. Uh, Excellent. That's all great information. So let's, yep. one last question that Bruce had gotten ahead of time, and then we'll see if there are any final questions that you guys have. So fire away if you've got them. Um, but one question that Bruce had ahead of time wa today was this issue about choosing the category when you are going to, you've got your Kindle book, you're, you're ready to load and you're, you gotta, you gotta classify it by category. And there are different schools of thought on that. So Bruce, why don't you fire away? So when you're doing a cat, what the category is uh, is on your book is tells Amazon where your book is going to sit in the Amazon catalog. So is it going to be in nonfiction? Is it going to be in mystery? Is it going to be in, uh, you know, uh, you know, fishing or wherever it's going to be? There's a category and there are a lot of categories. And so depending what you're doing, and I'm not instead of I'm not going to talk about sort of doing a bestseller sort of strategy where you do sort of certain category things. We just talk about the general categories that you assign your books. So and when you upload your Kindle book or your Create Space print book, you are asked to pick categories of where you think your book sits. On the Create Space side, you pick one category. On the Kindle side, you pick two. The confusion comes is because when you are uploading your book, you're using the basis categories, which are general book categories that don't match at all, at all or at some degree to the Amazon category. So there's always a confusion when you have finally picked a category that you've looked at and you go and you upload it and those categories don't exist. So you have to kind of do some things to get that to happen. But generally what you want is you want your book to show up and the easiest way to come up with a category is look for your competitors. So let's say you're doing a book on fly fishing and outdoor sportsman fishing things. You want your book to show up in the fly fishing outdoor sportsman area. You don't want it showing up in beauty tips or weight loss tips. 
So you want to look at search on Amazon, find where you think your book be. So search on what you your book title, see where it shows up, look at the best selling books that are in that area and look at the categories. And if to find the categories, if you scroll down the page, the Amazon sales page down, so you have the book and you'll have some, you know, other people buy books and descriptions and things down about a foot and a half or a foot or so, you'll see a thing called product details. And in the product details are sort of the specs about your book. And one of the things at the bottom of that are the categories that the book you're looking at has been assigned to. So you'll see the little string and it'll say, you know, fiction, romance, um, you know, something romance. And they'll, they'll assign that book into that category. So you can get a good example. You can sort of look at your competitors. You can see what categories the books are in. And then you can go and use those to help you put design categories for your books. Things to remember about categories is because there's a mismatch between the basis categories that you use when you're uploading your book and the categories that eventually your book is going to be in is you want to add these categories into your book description. Maybe you work them into your book title. You also want to put them into the keywords. So there's three areas that when you're uploading your book um, that you can put category information in. One is the title. So that you may use that or may not use that. One is the keywords, but also there is the book description. Remember, books are found by searching, and people search for books on Google and on Amazon. So you can help Amazon figure out where your book goes by putting the categories into the correct places. So, so look at your competition. See where your book is sitting. You can also kind of help your book out a lot is if you pick categories, if you're category is one that has a lot of superstars at the top of it. You have an Oprah at the top or you have a, um, you know, Michael, Dr. Hyatt or or Michael Hyde or somebody, you may have a hard time sort of moving your book up because you have these big heavyweights at the top of it. So you can sort of slide your book to the left or right of the category to one that doesn't have a lot of superstars or big names at the top of it, it might help you go up in, into the ranking. But um, yeah. so that's sort of the, the basic category is look at your competition. The other thing I do is is take your title, put it into Google, and, and see where your book shows up. Does your book title show up where you think it's going to be? And by using the categories, you can sort of make sure you want it to show up where the other books are of that same uh, type of book are. So it's important to, to sort of And that, that. those folks at KDP Select, or KDP, not KDP Select, sorry about that. Uh, those folk at Kindle Direct Publishing is what it is, is they're, they're really helpful. I mean, honestly, I've I've sent them emails from my account and I've gotten a response pretty quickly, you know, in a day. And to me, that's pretty quickly with a, an organization the size of Amazon. So I've gotten responses pretty quickly and they are genuinely service oriented. So I have never had anyone who did not respond with courtesy, who did not say, hey, how can I help you? And who didn't actively work to help me solve the problem that I have. So don't ever hesitate to reach out to them because really they're great people and they're there, they're there to help you succeed because your success is their success. And Amazon really does get that. I know they take a lot of, of bad rap sometimes, but you know, I'm happy with the relationship that I've had with them. One thing that I would encourage you, two things. Um, one thing I would encourage you to do, though, is if, if like Bruce is saying, you're having a hard time, you know, you thought your, your book should be in X category, but then when you actually went to upload it, you didn't see that listed. And we won't get into the tech behind why that is. Just know that it is. All you have to do is in your email to Amazon, you know, you classify it as unclassified, right? So you pick unclassified. And then you just say, my, you know, this is the, the category that I wanted. And, do and it they'll later. do it. There's right. some little gadgety thing that they have to do on their end and they make it happen. So, right. you know, that's really awesome. Um, th the other thing is about choosing the category. I worked with a client who was relaunching her book and she had like, she was in the, the self-help, just general self-help category, right? So she's competing against, you know, the four agreements and, and the alchemist and, you know, she never getting that that deal. So what we did was we really, I really thought about it and I looked at the subcategories and she really, cause, and in all honesty, it wasn't like she had a book about basket weaving and I was putting it in <laughs> astrophysics or anything. She had a book that was all about helping a family 
grow and helping the mom deal with you know some emotional issues so i was able to slice that category and i think it was something like mental health and families hey that related absolutely it wasn't like right. i picked some bizarre thing and she was then able to not that it happened instantly right but we were able to get that to be a bestseller and and a number one bestseller so that's the kind of thinking that you want to do you know i call it a cocktail exercise not that I'm endorsing alcoholic <laughs> beverages, but the <laughs> beverage of your choice, you know, where you sit back with your feet up one day and you just kind of stroke your chin and go, hmm, now where should my book go? And then you'll get, you know, get that kind of so, insight. I was yeah. say, if you go, if you want to sort of see what all the categories are and where books sort of sit, if you go to either the general Kindle main page or the general printed book page, either one of those, not sort of inside, but just the general page, and you look on the left-hand side of the screen and you look down, you'll see the list of the categories, all the different categories. So you see romance and nonfiction and <clears throat> marketing and, 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 you know, health and all that kind of stuff, all that stuff, technology. And you'll see if there's little numbers at them, you know, you're in the right place, but generally it's on sort of the, the main book homepage or the main Kindle book homepage. Right. And you can just scroll down through those categories click on one and you can kind of dig through the tree of different categories and right. see what shows up. What are the best selling books in there? What kind of what, how books are going and how these books are broken down. So you, you either look for books that are in your, your subject matter and go down into the product details and you'll see the little, you'll see the same sort of little string of, you know, from a big category down to a sub niche, you can see where books go, but you can also do it from the sort of the main home pages of, of books or Kindle books, and you can sort of dig that way to help you sort of select, you know, where you think your book belongs. Um, awesome. And, and a good exercise I also do is type your title into, um, we're talking mostly about nonfiction books here because it's a fiction. You could, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey could have been a book on, you know, you know painting. Um, but a nonfiction book, you want your book title to mean something. So if you type your title, your your anticipated title you're going to use, just type it into Amazon search and just see where it shows up. Does it show up where you think it's supposed to show up? If it does, then great. Then you're kind of in the right area. If it shows up in some other odd place, you need to make an adjustment to that and sort of fix your title. That's great. Uh, so that it goes to the right place. Great. So, so great, category great tips. It's serious. It's there's a lot of mystery that goes on on where you get it, but but Winnie's really right. What you're not sort of stuck there. Once if you made a mistake, and it's showing up in the wrong place, and give it a little while. It takes a little while for Amazon to figure out where your book belongs based on your title, your description, your keyword, and if it's showing up in a place you don't want it, then just look down at the bottom on Kindle. And you can email them or create space. They have a terrific um, customer service. Contact them and they'll fix that for you. So great. Awesome. Awesome tips. So there's one question. Miss Greenblatt asks, do we need to get permission to quote in a text from something that someone said in a YouTube video? I want you to know that's a fantastic question. And I am actively working to get somebody to come on the show, come on to Let's Talk Tech and talk about intellectual property. So you definitely want to uh, subscribe to the show at at techshowpodcast.com or become a fan of the show at the let's talk tech show.com so you can be in the know about what topics are coming up and, and what episodes are coming up um bruce do you have any thoughts on that um this is the tricky area some of it breaks down to public yeah. figure non-public figure so if it's That's president point. obama or a senator or congressman somebody who is in really in the public eye and they're saying something there you pretty much have rights to go do what you want with with their copy because they are a public figure, a U.S. government public figure. Right. If it's an actor or somebody you know that's that's saying things or a celebrity or things, it's a lot grayer, and so you want to be careful. Some people are manic about managing their what comes out of them. Some aren't. There are journalism rules on fair use and how much you can kind of use. Um, if you're really question, I use the stomach test a lot. If you kind of feel in your stomach and going, oh, I don't really know if this is good or not, it's probably not good. Check with somebody. Check with an intellectual property attorney just to make sure because you don't want to receive that that letter coming back. Um, I stay away from anything that has to do with Disney or Warner's or any big company that owns a huge amount of, of right. material that they are um, managing, you know, that they have as part of their brand that they're in charge of. They all have 
lots of lawyers and you know they send you those letters you may be completely in the right to do something but you know you don't want to have to fight something so you want to kind of approach this carefully um you know and or you just you know always want to give them credit but it's good to check with um an intellectual property attorney you know group the things together and say here are the things i'm trying to do and um, or you can also ask the person for permission. There's another way to do it is get permission from them. Just contact them. If they did it in the video, contact them, but put a comment and say, I would love to use you and I'd love to give you credit. Um, it happens to me a lot with some of my map products. People use them in books all the time. And, you know, they just ask me and I just give them permission. So um, so you want to just check. You want to be careful. People in the really the, the U.S. government top, those people are royalty free and copyright free. But after that, it's kind of gray. <laughs> So. Yeah, and so so uh, Ms. Greenblatt is is saying that this is for reporting on a research study. My guess is just this is my gut reaction that they're probably going to be okay. But I I would definitely ask permission. Right. You can just do that by going right to their YouTube channel, and and I would just put post it right there in the questions. Yep. Hey, can I I yep. want to quote from you, and they're going to get that message. There are so many YouTube channels though that aren't really properly monitored. And so, you know, it, it can be a little bit eh, scary about that. Right. But, you know, if it's educational, the issue, I think, at the at part of the issue at the root here is, are you making money from this? Right. You know, are you making money? If you're going to be making money from something that they said, then, you know, people get a little bit, hey, I want, I, you should have asked my permission. And right. Bruce's point about the lawyer thing is, is dead on. Like I said, my husband's a corporate lawyer. He's not an intellectual property lawyer. So I really know nothing right. about intellectual and be, property. And be careful about lawyers because you want to make sure you talk to an intellectual property lawyer, not your family attorney who handles your will right. in the States. They, just right. because they're lawyers, they don't necessarily know this. <laughs> so. Right. They specialize right. just like you and I do. And right. so attorneys, you know, there are all these little fine, my husband, he would freely tell you, he don't know nothing about intellectual property. He's always had paralegals and other experts right. on right. staff who he, who he had handle those issues. But, um, the, especially even the movie stars, you know, there are these people and rock stars, you know, especially and, the, and Elvis, Glenn Fry, do anything and, with Elvis, Elvis, let me and tell don't you do anything with major league base, any of the major leagues, oh, they are yeah. manic about protecting they their, they will come after you. Yeah. Um, the other, and the rest, one final thing I'll say on it too is, cause I do license a lot of my, my map products for books, all different kinds of books is depending on who is on the other end of that request. So I may get a request from an author who's doing a book and needs a map. If they're doing it for a, a regular publishing company, that publishing company has a lot of rules about they want to control and know what the licensing of all the content is. If I'm doing a book for, if you know, Winnie, if you called me and said, I need a map of my book, well, I know it's just going to you. There's no publishing company behind it. So it's a little looser. So you always want to kind of know where where that's going, where you're using it. Are you going into the money world or not? And I right. often say to people, nobody cares if you make a thousand dollars, but if you make a million dollars, people come you're out of the woodwork after what you did in your content. So you want to be yeah. covered and just protected. It's, it's worth the effort to fix, to make sure you've got it covered. You're covered. Yeah. You know? It's not worth the small gain and you know you want to then go and find another expert if if you can't get permission you know you've posted on their their youtube channel you've tried try, track them down through facebook you've tried to find their agent you've tried to get permission find somebody else Right. You can, you know, just find somebody else. It's just not worth it. And we mentioned Elvis and these other people. Priscilla Presley is legendary. <laughs> she is practically, she's the icon of image management. Okay. That was, that's really her job is to protect right. the Elvis right. estate. And she takes that seriously. I, she ought to be teaching seminars on that stuff. <laughs> they make more money. Elvis him. has made more money dead than he it's ever did alive because of and it's her, of her. Because of her. It's because right. of her. her. Yeah. Right. Uh, Priscilla right. is. They stay away from major league yeah. sports of any kind. Stay right. away from any big public company. That, that has a lot of content and manages their content right. like like a Disney or a Sony you know just stay away from those from using anything from those companies and awesome. um, and then just you know you know it's a quick thing to ask you know a, a, a you know intellectual property attorney 
they'll tell you right away whether you can do this or not. And there's plenty of them out there. You don't have to spend a fortune um, right. to, to kind of do it. So. So, so thank you guys very much for coming on. Thanks for the great participation. A big smooch to the Blab Queen, Gail Brown, for, for managing this. She rocks, I'm telling you right now. Um, the issue about the old TV sh and radio shows, I would, I would follow Bruce's recommendations. Re-listen to this. Uh, um, I'm going to be posting this uh the, the audio version of this I'll be posting in uh, as a podcast episode as as an after show follow up. So that will be at techshowpodcast.com on iTunes and the Let's Talk Tech Show dot com. Uh, and it will happen in a, a couple of days. So please be patient with me. But of course, the link to this will be live and you'll be able to enjoy that. So this has been the after show for Let's Talk Tech, this is, which is the podcast that the mystifies the software systems, services, and apps that you need to run and grow a profitable business. This has been a follow-up to a mini-series on self-publishing and book marketing with the fabulous Bruce Jones, who absolutely <laughs> rocks. You definitely want to find him at brucethebookguy.com. Be, sh be sure you get his, his book and on brucethebookguy.com, he's got all kinds of fantastic free information. So you want to just make sure you get that for him. And if you like the information you heard and experienced today, you want to be sure to subscribe to the Let's Talk Tech Show at techshowpodcast.com. Become a fan of the show at the Let's Talk Tech Show.com. Wait, it's podcast. Yes. Oh, God. It's techpodcast.com on iTunes. It's only Wednesday and I'm like this and I'm going to be on a blab tonight. So stay tuned. I'll be a total mess. So, but thank you, my friends, for joining us. I look forward to catching you uh, uh, soon on an episode of Let's Talk Tech and seeing you again on Wednesdays for the after show. So stay tuned. Love you. This is the end. So we're going to X out and I will catch up with you guys soon. See ya. Bye-bye.